Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and welcome. I am Lucinda Offer. I am the executive director of the Mars Society, and I'm very honored to welcome you to our 22nd annual International Mars Society Convention here at USC. We are truly grateful for your attendance and your support. Thank you for being here and sharing with us as we learn about all the exciting missions and research from Mars. Before I introduce, you, uh, introduce our opening speaker, I would first like to thank the Marshall School of Business and the Southern California Commercial Space Flight Initiative for their invaluable partnership in this year's convention. We have a debate tonight with their director, Greg Archery, and Dr. Zubron on NASA's proposed gateway, and I hope you will join us for that. It is a very exciting time with the forward momentum of private space and technology where we are pushed to be innovative to solve the challenges that come with the human space program. And we will. And it makes sense that the business world would find inspiration from space. And now may I please introduce our first speaker, who is someone I greatly admire and am proud to work with, an honor of many books, including The Case for Mars and now The Case for Space, our president of the Mars Society, who's an absolute inspiration for us with all things Mars, and I'm sure for you too, please welcome Dr. Robert Zubrin. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for coming. Uh, and for being part of this movement, uh, which I think will be remembered by future ages as the most important thing going on in the world at this time. And most of the other stuff isn't worth remembering, but <laughs> there's a lot out there that people will want to forget, but, the, uh, but not this. Okay, so um, yes. Uh, so I'm, what I'm going to talk about today is, is in fact the thesis of my new book, uh, The Case for Space, The Revolution in Space Flight, The Future of Unlimited Possibilities. That's an awful lot to talk about in half an hour. I won't be able to deal with it properly, but fortunately there's the book and they're on sale today, 20 bucks even. You buy them, I'll sign them. It's a win-win situation. <laughs> but I'm going to wait, wait till the morning session closes and I'll be out there. Okay. Stick around for all the speakers. We've got some really great speakers this morning, including some that were instrumental in creating uh, this revolution. Um, okay, so um, first chart, yes. Okay, so I think everyone here saw this live. Okay, this is February 2018. This is the launch and landing of Falcon Heavy. And to understand what a remarkable event this was, 2010, Barack Obama appoints my former boss, Norm Augustine, to head the Blue Ribbon Commission to determine if the Bush Moon Initiative was possible within reasonable financial constraints. Answer, no. Why? Because developing a heavy lift vehicle will take $36 billion in 12 years. Okay. SpaceX did it in six years at a cost of less than $1 billion, and to cap it all, the thing is three quarters reusable. Okay, that's just amazing. Okay, and of course, now they are moving ahead towards creating a vehicle that will make this obsolete. Now, that's something we've seen in industries like this, uh, where companies introduce technologies that make their previous generation obsolete. This is not something we've seen in the space industry. Okay, uh, the, 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 where systems are still operating that were introduced 30, 40, even 50 years ago. Um, okay, uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, but not only has SpaceX introduced a, system, a, 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 a number of very useful systems, um, dragons, falcons, and so on, and soon, relatively soon, starships, maybe not as soon as Musk says, but soon, 
by aerospace standards. Um, they've proven a point, which is that it's possible for a well-led entrepreneurial organization to do things uh, that the mainstream aerospace industry had come to think of, uh, doing them in one-third the time, at one-tenth the cost or less, okay, and even do things that they had deemed just impossible altogether. Okay? And as a result of this, they have set loose an international space race. Okay? Okay, of course, this Blue Origin, which was inspired by SpaceX. Okay, um, uh, somewhat separate thing, uh, but along a parallel track, the Virgin Atlantic. Okay, so those are being pushed by uh, uh, people who, of Musk's type, uh, billionaires who have money and they want to do something historic. But the others, okay, next chart. New Zealand Rocket Lab. This is a company started by a working engineer, someone with no more personal resources than many of us in this room. Got investors. <laughs> $300 million, and they've reached orbit. New Zealand has reached orbit, even though New Zealand does not have a space program. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, New Zealand has reached orbit through a private individual, and not a billionaire, nothing of the sort. And this has opened this thing up. There are companies in Ukraine, uh, and in companies that do have space programs. Uh, uh, I was invited to a space launch in China, done not by the government, but by an entrepreneurial uh, space company called the Link Space. And, and they took off, they flew 100 meters up in the sky, hovered there in the face of a 20 knot wind, hovered. NASA wouldn't even launch in this wind. And they came and landed exactly on the launch pad, putting themselves down like a crate of eggs. They'll probably reach orbit in two or three years. Uh, and, and so this is, opened this up regardless of nationality. And they're going to compete, and they're going to drive the cost of launch down. You know, the cost of space launch went down a lot from 1957 to 1969, as, as basically during the Apollo period, we and the Soviets perfected uh, uh, essentially all the major systems needed for space flight. Okay? Uh, but then it stagnated for 40 years until uh, 2010. From 69 to 2010, there was absolutely no drop in the cost of space launch. Since 2010, in one decade, it has fallen by a factor of five, from 10,000 a kilogram to 2,000 a kilogram. If Starship is successful, it'll go to $700 a kilogram. Okay, uh, and the cheaper it launch, it, it launch is, the more launches there will be, and the less conservative spacecraft designers are going to have to be, which means space technology is going to advance faster. Okay. Uh, both in quality and in lower cost, okay? And, uh, you know, last year there were about 100 satellite launches in the whole world. Uh, I think very soon we're going to go to two or 300. Um, but the, another market is going to open up. Next chart. Okay, well, this just refers to another revolution that is in play right now, which is the micro spacecraft revolution. It's now possible to make 10 kilogram satellites that could do what it previously took a 1,000 kilogram satellite to do. These CubeSats started out as little educational projects. Now they're functional real spacecraft. Two of them went to Mars with InSight. Okay. Uh, you know, this is happening. Next chart. And reusable launch vehicles open up an entirely different kind of market. One not with hundreds of launches per year, but hundreds of launches per day which is intercontinental travel. You know, for 3,000 years, people have made money on the ocean. But, okay, some have actually extracted wealth from the ocean, for instance, by fishing or sponging or something. But the much bigger money has been made by using the ocean as a global medium of low drag transport. Okay, that's where the serious money has been in the ocean. Well, space is a global ocean of zero drag connecting every point to any other point through which you can travel from anywhere to anywhere in less than an hour. Now, this doesn't work for every place. Uh, okay, it, it might be tough for Paris because it's inland and metropolitan, but there's plenty of major cities that are ports that you could put the space launch pad 20 kilometers offshore and launch from there and land on there and, and, and do that kind of thing. And, and this is just huge. And if we go from hundreds of launches a year to hundreds of launches a day, because there are hundreds of intercontinental flights every hour, okay, 
uh, that turns space technology into a mass production industry. You know, a rocket engine is less complex than your car, but it costs, you know, uh, three orders of magnitude more because the car is a mass production item and the, uh, the rocket engine is not. Okay. And the, 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 uh, so this can completely change the picture. Okay. Next chart. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Now the bad news. Now, the, uh, <laughs> Um, all right, the, the revolution offers us the chance to uh, economically explore and even settle the moon and Mars, but the agencies have to embrace it. Now NASA, NASA actually has two modes of operation. They have a purpose-driven mode of operation and a vendor-driven mode of operation. In the purpose-driven mode, they spend money to do things. In the vendor-driven mode, they do things to spend money. Okay, um, and uh, during Apollo, NASA's human spaceflight program was purpose-driven. The science program has always and remains purpose-driven, but the human spaceflight program has become vendor-driven. And for instance, I, I, we're going to talk a little bit more about this tonight. Okay, but I mean, this is just ridiculous. Okay, the the the, the maximum complexity, maximum cost, seeking to give as many players as possible a piece of the action. Okay. Um, which also means maximum risk. If any one of those four launches fail, the mission fails, uh, this is irresponsible. Uh, but if they embrace this, next chart, okay, I've laid out a plan, it's called Moon Direct, which takes advantage of the capabilities being offered by the entrepreneurial revolution. And one more revolution, which has been made possible by the mainstream space agencies, which is the discovery of materials on the moon and Mars that can be turned into resources. Okay, water on the moon, in the craters, on the South Pole. Okay, that's why you want the moon base on the moon, because that's where the water is. It's not at lunar orbit. Okay, um, and of course, Mars. Um, I don't have time to discuss this today, it's in the book. Uh, next chart. Okay, and it also discusses how we can get the water out of the crater. Next chart, Mars Direct. Okay, now, SpaceX has laid out a plan to use the Starship to fly all the way to the surface of Mars, refuel it there with methane and oxygen, and fly it direct back from the surface. Um, that plan is... Uh, it's conceptually simple, but it's non-optimal uh, because the Starship is so large, it uh, increases the uh, in-situ resource utilization requirements, the power needed to drive it by an order of magnitude. It also puts the Starship out of action for a thousand days when if you were just using it as a fully reusable Earth-to-orbit vehicle and staging off of it to launch payloads like these to Mars, you can use it again in 10 days. So that decreases utility of the Starship by a factor of 100 and increases the ISRU requirements by a factor of 10. So that's not the right way to do it. But nevertheless, a fully reusable heavy lift vehicle delivering payloads to Earth orbit, what's not to like? Okay, and that could be greatly enabling for uh, human exploration of Mars. Um, next chart. And, well, we're going to hear a lot about this at this conference. We have. Uh, the finalists, 10 finalists of um, over, uh, of exactly actually 100 entrants on how to design a 100 person, 1,000 uh, person Mars colony, taking into account not only their technological requirements, but the economic requirements, social, political, and aesthetic requirements uh, of creating new branches of human civilization. But I think that's where this can go. Okay, next chart. One can discuss mining asteroids, I do in the book. Next chart, outer solar system. Why would anyone go there? Uh, well, got news for you, there's something in the outer solar system that could be turned into an immense resource for humanity, uh, and that's helium-3. There's some helium-3 on the moon, and that's an ideal fuel for fusion reactors, but vastly more of it in the atmospheres of the outer planets. Jupiter would be very difficult to mine. The gravity is much too large. But Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, you actually uh, can uh, conceptually sketch out how we could mine those atmospheres for helium-3. And we're talking about millions of times more energy reserves than all the fossil fuels and even the thorium of Earth. 
Um, and it's the ideal fuel for fusion reactors. Well, fusion, okay, well, we've heard about that forever. We're not going to get fusion, right? It's like reusable space launch. Next chart. Okay, and in fact, now, you know, Musk never talks about fusion. He's not interested in fusion. Musk is into solar power. But Musk has actually precipitated uh, a revolution in the fusion field. Because what happened was, based on the example of SpaceX, is a number of financial heavy hitters had looked at the fusion thing and said, huh, maybe the problem here is like reusable space launch. Maybe the problem was not fundamentally technical. Maybe it's institutional. Uh, and, you know, I, I have to tell you, I actually worked in the fusion program in the 1980s at Los Alamos. And uh, I can remember a group uh, lunch, and the group leader said to us, you know, when fusion power is finally developed, it's not going to be at a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be a couple of crackpots working in a garage. And we all laugh, because fusion's hard, okay? But, and I still think that was a bit much, but if not a couple of crackpots in a garage, a startup working in a warehouse, okay? And there's a number of these things that have been funded. That's TAE a, uh, e Energy over here. That's in California. They've gotten $500 million in investment. That's more than the U.S. government fusion program. Okay? And these people are not proceeding on a schedule like the ITER, which took 30 years to decide where they would put it. Okay? You know, in technology projects, time is people times cost. If you want to save money, you do it fast. Okay, and they're moving fast, and, and we're going to see real results from these companies uh, in, in, in the coming decade. And in fact, I think within five years, uh, you're going to see amazing stuff. Uh, that, by the way, is a spherical tokamak that's in uh, Britain. That's actually the project I was working on at Los Alamos, and they're building it. Uh, okay, next chart. And the thing about fusion, okay. Fusion, yes, it is another way to light light bulbs, but that's not what's important about it, really. Okay, it is, but there are other ways to light light bulbs. You can do it with solar energy, you can do it with windmills, you can do it with natural gas, coal, waterfalls, fission, anything. But it can, it's a new kind of energy. It allows you to do new kinds of things, including fusion rockets, okay, which uh, can get exhaust velocities on the order of 7% the speed of light. So a, a rocket vehicle can typically just be designed to get up to about twice its exhaust velocity. So you're talking about systems that can get over 10% the speed of light. You're talking about systems that not only represent the capability of rapid travel around our solar system, but even a marginal capability for interstellar travel. That's what has been unleashed. Next chart. And, okay, terraforming. We're going to do that too. Next chart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm moving fast, okay. Now, all that's the what and the how. I spend about a third of the book talking about the why, why it is necessary that humanity embrace this historic opportunity. And I give a number of reasons. It's for the knowledge, for the challenge, for our survival, and for the future. Okay, the knowledge, okay, that's the one the mainstream space agencies do talk about all the time, and they're right. Okay, uh, breakthroughs in physics that typically come from astronomy, uh, and, and, and I believe breakthroughs in biology are going to come from extraterrestrial exploration. You know, all light, you know, people talk about the wonders of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology already exists. It's called life, self-replicating microscopic machines. Okay, but there's only one type that we know about, the type that uses RNA and DNA. All life on Earth uses that operating system, that alphabet, for recording, transmitting information. It's one way to convey information and to control organisms. And there's minor variations. You know, we, the English-speaking people, use the Latin alphabet. The French use Latin alphabet with a slight variation, a couple of different things on some letters. Spanish, same thing. Germans, okay. Russians use an alphabet that's somewhat different although there's a clear relationships, a number of letters in common, and the basic system is the same. But the Chinese use something totally different. It's not a common origin. 
It has nothing in common. It doesn't use, it, it's not even that the letters are different. It's a totally different way of conveying information, and the language itself uses totally different principles of operation. Okay. Uh, so, life in the universe, it needs a method of recording information, but is it going to be the Latin alphabet? Is it going to be an alphabet phonetic like uh, English and Russian and Hebrew? Okay, or is it going to be something totally different like Chinese, which is equally functional but uses a different system of operation? Okay, and if you can access different ways of doing this, you can create new powers over nature. And then, of course, th this, by the way, is Sarah Seeger, the astronomer. She's delivering the results of the Kepler mission, one in five stars in our galaxy has a ha ha Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. One in five, that's 80 billion stars in our galaxy. The universe is alive, this is what we're discovering. Next chart. Okay, survival. Okay, everybody knows about asteroid impacts. Here's an important fact you need to know about space, uh, about Earth, which is where it is. It's in space. Okay, the Earth is in space. You are living in outer space, and uh, or in heaven if you prefer. Now, the... Um, Okay, although you can get burned at the stake for saying that, like Bruno was, but the, um, so you should just say space. But the, in any case, um, okay, everything in space is moving around and ramming into each other, and occasionally it causes mass extinctions. We get smaller impacts all the time, okay? This is the past 25 years, okay? December 18th, last year, we had 150 kiloton uh, impact over the Bering Sea. That's 10 times the Hiroshima bomb. So we got to get control of this flight traffic. Okay, now I, I don't have any sympathy for the people who say we got to go into space so that if the Earth is destroyed by an asteroid, there'll be some survivors somewhere else. Uh, to me, that's stupid. We're not going into space to desert the Earth. We're going into space to protect the Earth. Okay, enough said. The, the, next chart. Okay, the challenge. Okay, there's, these show the, how we tripled the number of science graduates in the United States during the Apollo period. Okay, and then it stagnated immediately after that. Uh, we've been benefiting from that ever since, to an extent that it vastly exceeded the cost of the Apollo program. Okay, this is where the people who created the computer revolution came from. And the, the uh, a humans to Mars program, bold space program would have impact that greatly exceed this because, uh, you know, science, the bold space program makes science the great adventure. Youth loves adventure. That's what the spirit of youth is all about. And, okay, in the 60s, okay, those are almost all boys because science and engineering was not really open to women or for the most part minorities in the same sense that it is today, not in any real way. Uh, so now you not only get millions of little boy mad scientists making rocket fuel and robots in the basement, you get little girl mad scientists, which is a scary thought, but the, uh, but there it is. Uh, and, okay, and now next chart. For the future. Now there's two aspects to this. How you conceive the far future and what the far future could look like. Well, if we do what we can do today, then 500 years from now, okay, there will be new branches of human civilization, not only dozens of them on Mars. Mars is big enough for more than one flag, more than one culture, and the asteroid belt, but on hundreds of stars, cir planets circling stars in this region of the galaxy. New cultures, new languages, new literatures, new traditions, new forms of social organization, vast varied contributions to science and technology, new heroes, new tales of epic deeds to inspire people to go further. That is something grand and wonderful, and if you have it in your power to do something grand and wonderful, then you should. So we should. But there's something else, which is how you conceive of the future, depend, the far future, depends, will control what happens in the near future. Now, people talk about threats to humanity today and global warming, resource exhaustion, asteroid impact, overpopulation, some people still talk about, uh, whatever. I don't think any of those things are the real threat to humanity today. Some of them are issues that need to be dealt with, some are overdrawn. But the real threat to humanity comes from bad ideas. Humanity did not have catastrophes in the 20th century because of resource 
depletion, global warming, overpopulation, or asteroids. It had it because of bad ideas, and in particular, one bad idea with a number of variants to it. And that bad idea is that there isn't enough to go around. Okay, so here, okay, 1912, General Friedrich von Bernhardi, chief intellectual of the German general staff, writes an international bestseller entitled in English, Germany in the Next War. So bestseller, and he says, look, okay, here's Eurasia. Okay, either we, the Germans are gonna get it or the Russians are gonna get it. There's only so much to go around. We're gonna have to have it out with them sooner or later. Um, should it be sooner or later? Well, clearly sooner because we've got to knock them out before they industrialize. And so two years later, they take advantage of the assassination of the Archduke to initiate World War I, which is the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century that sets in motion most of the rest. Okay, then 1939, Hitler even more hysterically, the laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live. Germany needs living space. It's nonsense. Germany today is smaller than the Third Reich, has a larger population, but a vastly higher standard of living uh, because of technological progress, uh, some of which has been done by Germans, but most of which has been done by people all over the world, including notably people of, of, of types that the Germans, the Nazis wanted to exterminate. Okay? So it is simply not true that humanity is composed of nations or races in a struggle for existence over scarce resources. That is a, a, a false point of view, but nevertheless, if it is embraced, it has the capability of causing absolute catastrophe. And today, I happen to know, because I have talked to them myself, that there are people in the American national security establishment who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Because there's over a billion of them, and if they have a standard of living like us and they all have cars, there isn't going to be enough oil in the world. Okay? And you can bet your bottom dollar that there are people in comparable positions in Beijing who look at this thing from the other side of the chessboard and think exactly the same thing. And if, if, if that kind of thinking is allowed to prevail, war is guaranteed. And it only becomes tactical questions as to where and how and when and under what pretext. Okay? The, 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 now, this is a false point of view. Okay? I mean, the fundamental point of view is Malthusian. Uh, there's only so much resources, population increases, standard of livings go down. In fact, history shows the exact opposite. As the world's population has gone up, the standard of living has gone up. Why? Okay, because consumption depends upon production. Production is people times technology. Okay, the more people there are, the more inventors there are, and inventions are cumulative. And that is why People create resources, okay? There's no such thing as a natural resource. There's only natural raw materials. They are turned into resources by resourceful people, okay? The, the, and it's not that we're gonna get oil from Mars. It's that we're gonna disprove a fallacy, okay? We're gonna disprove this fallacy that there's only so much to go around, that there, there's a roof on the Earth. So there's not a roof on the Earth. The Earth comes with an infinite sky and it's wide open. And that's the case for space. Thank you. I have time, I think, for one or two questions. Next to a mic. Go to, sir. Hi there. Thank you very much for the book. Uh, and thanks for all your other hard work over all the years. Um, my question is related to the expansion uh, onto the moon and Mars of other industrial complexes. 3D printing seems to be an easy way to, to do things. Cooking the rocks to get the oxygen out. You look at the white stuff, it's aluminum. You look at the dark stuff, it's iron and titanium. There's lots of resources out there because there's more resources in space than there are on Earth. When are we going to see an acknowledgement within the rest of our society that that's where the resources are rather than trying to fight and squabble over the resources here? Well, that, that, that's the essential point. Okay, first of all, the resources are not there. The resources are here. Okay, okay that's where the resources are. But the materials are there. The space is there. There's a lot of space in space. Okay, so if you need living space, there it is. Uh, but the, 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 the problem is this, okay? If we didn't go into space, we're still not gonna run out of resources, okay? But to prove that to people 
is difficult. It's like proving to a mathematically uneducated person that there's an infinite number of points in a line segment. Okay? If you know math, you know that there are, in fact, the infinite number of points in a line segment. But if you don't, it's, that seems impossible. Okay? But anyone can see that there's an infinite number of points in a line that goes on forever in both directions. And that's what we have to show. Okay? It's a question of winning a battle of ideas. One more question. Sir. Yeah. Uh, John Randall, thank you for your hard work with the years and the right. But can you say, can you put this succinctly that without space, Earth's future is a zero sum game, but with space, it is an infinite? I, I, I don't quite agree with that. Okay, because once again, I do think that there are an infinite number of points in a line segment. But look, Europe was not running out of resources in 1914. Europe was doing better in 1914 than it ever had been in, in history. Okay? The, the, the world was doing better. Okay? But it was this idea that it was a zero-sum game that caused the self-destruction of the civilization. Okay, ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences. We need to spread good ideas. Thank you.